Welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Trustees. Today is Tuesday, November 14th. I'd like to call to order. Mr. Kaling. Present. Dr. Spencer Robinson. Here. Mr. Quadro. Present. Mayor Ciara is due. And, and Dr. Bonner. Present. Thank you. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mission, mission statement. Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School is to prepare, prepare students for social responsibility, employment, and post-secondary education through rigorous applied technical and academic programs. Thank you. Is there any participation by the public this evening? There is no participation by the trustees. Yes, I learned so much at the joint conference of the Massachusetts Association of School Committees and Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents last week. And it was a treat to experience it with my fellow trustees, Mr. Kaling, Mr. Quadro, and Dr. Bonner, as well as Superintendent Lincoln Hoker. The program advisory night was an impressive display of the partnerships our excellent faculty members have with in the industry professionals in the community as well as parents and students. I want to share my gratitude for the time everyone devoted to ensuring that our students receive a vocational education that effectively prepares them for today's workforce. And finally, I recently contacted Senator Cumberford to express my appreciation for her advocacy with her Senate colleagues in support of the act relative to the use of hoisting equipment in Chapter 74 of Vocational Technical Education. And in her response, she suggested that we send a formal letter to the Senate President asking for support of this bill. And that's why you see it on our agenda tonight. Dr. Lincoln Homer did a wonderful job of drafting it for us. Thank you. Mr. Uh, <clears throat> sure. I also attended conferences. Um, Ms. Spencer Robinson indicated uh, I was pleased to uh, tell a number of people not familiar with Smith Vocational, our history, which uh, I'm getting to learn more and more about and uh, gives me a, a lot of pride to tell that story and when you start telling that story the questions really start coming out. People in the eastern part of the state don't really know who we are but I think the word's getting out. That's all I got to say for now. Thanks. On the Division 8 meeting uh, it was brought up that's vocational <clears throat> part that uh, there were some changes made from Don Erickson and uh, Charles uh, Lyons. 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 Charles Lyons took over his spot. Oh, no. No, no. Oh, no. In no. <laughs> Anyways, so we've had some changes in the, uh, the Division 8. So, had Correct. We, and then we had a Division 5 meeting, which is the Western Massachusetts schools, and they were looking for a chairperson for Division 5. And that's in the works also. So we'll be getting uh, more updates, but we did attend those meetings as well. And I will say that the uh, we had a great session on um, the intelligence uh, part of it of the new computer of uh, and and it really uh, MIT professor uh, really artificial intelligence. Yes, artificial. Thank you. Yep. And. Uh, it really is is obviously coming to bear a lot faster, uh, and uh, it's uh, our students are probably learning about a lot faster than we are, and uh, so we have to be aware of uh, how they're utilizing that product. And uh, I think the instructor from MIT gave us a good heads up on how to monitor that, 
and uh, <clears throat> so I've got a lot of the buzzwords and I do have uh, my brother Bob's son Anthony is uh, very up to date on that so I've got my in-house counsel and, uh, <laughs> for the future. <laughs> Well, I'd like to uh, add on to what Mr. Kaling said about <coughs> Division 5. Um, we've had a meeting here in the past. Um, it's a central location, so we, we offered up this location again for future Division 5 meetings, which certainly works for us, and it seemed to work for the other people. Um, they all felt it was a central location and very accommodating room and uh, people. So hopefully we'll have a Division 5 meeting here in the future. Thank you, Rick. May I have a motion this second to approve the minutes? Uh, excuse me, the October 17th Board of Trustee meeting. So Second. Any additional All discussion? Favor. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah. 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 We have some representatives from FFA who had a, an amazing trip recently. So FFA, you want to come down and Ready on. I'll be your PowerPoint clicker. Ready on. Anywhere you're comfortable. Is this fine? Yeah. Um, so recently we just got back from our trip from Nationals, which is in Indiana, and we flew into Chicago, so we visited some places in Chicago as well. Um, <clears throat> one of our teams that competed was our forestry team. They placed bronze overall. Um, Serafina Gibson placed silver individual. Jameson LaValle and Sam Ryan placed bronze individual. Uh, our livestock team uh, was a bronze team overall. Haley Ann placing silver individual. Katrina Chase, Hannah Marcel, and Oliver Waters placed bronze individuals. And then our, we had a dan, dairy handling individual. She placed gold in like all, all the states. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Ag marketing team was Nellie Davidson, Suzanne Daniel, and Alan Devino. They placed bronze overall. And then we had two American degrees. Um, that's two out of the four candidates for Massachusetts, uh, Keegan Lennon and Sarah. And then uh, we toured some places. We toured the um, mint distillery, so students learned about the process of mint oil distilling along with other herbs. They also learned about corn ethanol. And then we also visited a feed mill. Uh, students learned about grain mixing, storage, and the process it takes to feed both cattle and hogs. Uh, we visited a harvest. Students learned about the process of growing corn and soybeans and the process of collecting it. They were also given the opportunity to take a ride on the combine. Uh, we went to a rodeo. Students enjoyed the night at the rodeo after a long day of competitions. We also learned more about like the behind the stage um, stuff, so, like the animal care and stuff like that. Uh, we went to visit Fair Oaks. Students took a tour of the dairy part of Fair Oaks, learning about the process of giving birth along with different parts of the milking process by visiting the birthing barn, barns along with the robot barn and the rotary milk. milk, milk. And then here's some more pictures of that. And then we did some team bonding, so we went to a haunted uh, attraction. We saw some bison and took, took a carriage ride. And then uh, please consider our Texas Roadhouse Dining Night, which will be tomorrow from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. Just tell them that you are with us at FFA and they will donate 10% of your bill to our children. So it's fair to say that Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School is holding its own nationally? Yes. We do pretty good. That's very exciting. Especially in dairy. Can you, do you happen to know what an American degree is? Uh, so you get your green hand, your chapter, and then your base state while you're in high school. And then two years after you graduate, you can apply for your American degree. And you have to have a certain amount of hours in agriculture um, in high school and then outside of high school. So in college, you have to study something that is in 
So it, stuff, it symbolizes the acquired knowledge yes. in spirit. Yeah, it's very good. In applications, so after high school, staying in the industry, I think about one percent of FFA members eventually receive their degrees. Mm -hmm. Such a small percentage. And two of our students receive. Um, <clears throat> I just lost my train of thought. So it is it, the competitions are nationwide, national yep. competitions. So do you feel you're well prepared for these competitions against your peers? Yes, well, I. I think so, yeah. We spend a lot of time preparing just for state level. So if we make it to national level, we spend even more time preparing and getting ready. And it's more like hands-on with your um, advisor because it's a smaller team of usually four. So you get more like of the practice that you need before you leave for nationals. Great. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thank you. They're not here this evening, but the, the advisors that we have, um, I know when Mr. Bianca and I, we've been going to the, the state level FFA convention since we've basically been here for about 10 years or so, and those first couple of years of the state convention, um, you know, we, we weren't necessarily competing at the state level, okay? We were definitely uh, outperformed, and uh, year in and year out, uh, I, I want to first uh, thank and congratulate the advisors. They've really raised the bar uh, to the point now, if you go to the state convention, recently, uh, it's, it's basically the Smith Show. Yeah, we're right up there. With it's them almost now. a little embarrassing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's impressive. So. Because they, you yeah. just keep hearing the Smith yeah. It's great. So. Congratulations. Thank you. And, um, who are the advisors? Ms. So Mr. Yeah. Anspach, Ms. Evangelista, yeah. and um, Ms. Irish are the three advisors this year. <clears throat> So good evening, everybody. So uh, we are going to change up the system a little bit. So we're doing some musical chairs because of technology needs. But uh, you know, in talk to, talking to Dr. Spencer Robinson, we felt that perhaps more having a, having more of a conversation with me sitting at the table having a conversation uh, would be worthwhile. I, I, I agree. So. Uh, here I am. In front of you, you should have the PowerPoint, so you don't necessarily have to turn around and look at uh, the slide behind you. Uh, the PowerPoint behind us is more for the, you know, the peanut gallery so they can follow along. So with that said, uh, the same format. Uh, so the, the first topic is the instructional leadership. Just a few updates uh, from this past month. Uh, we've had a heavy focus on NEAC. We've had a couple steering committee meetings. Uh, one, we actually had Bruce Sievers, who's one of the associate commissioners, I think he's commissioner, of NEAC. He's the one who oversees the CTE schools in New England. So he came out about a week ago, met with our steering committee. Uh, it was nice to hear that we're probably ahead of the curve at this point. Uh, and as a reminder to the board, uh, we have our, our visiting team will be visiting us in March, uh, the middle of March, for a couple of days. Uh, so we're beginning to, beginning to prepare for that. Can you tell us what NEAC is? It's the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. Okay. Uh, so it's uh, sort of our region's version of the accrediting body. Uh, you know, I, I think we all, all have our own feelings about the NEAC and you know, the validity of it. Uh, but the purpose behind NEAC is to ensure that all schools have a minimum set of standards that we live by. Uh, at the end of the day, we want to make sure our students have the education that they deserve. And uh, you know, before the Department of Ed, before Ed Reform, before MCAS, before all the accountability, there really wasn't anything uh, for schools to be measured by. Uh, and that's why NAAC was there, uh, and they were very, very important. You know, so some of their weight has decreased over the years because of all the accountability uh, at the state level, uh, but it is still nice to, to have NAAC come in. Uh, they, they, they come in more from a supportive perspective. That's sort of their mindset, their mission, uh, is to not necessarily be uh, paper pushers and accountability are very negative. Uh, they're there to, to try to support us, um, <coughs> reinforce the good things that we're doing, and encourage areas of, of growth for us. Um, typically, our area of growth, over the last since we've been here for 10 years, has been the facilities and um, you know, the revenue sources around the governor's model. How do we find the money to support the facilities that we have? That's what they keep hounding on us. Um, but as far as the instruction and the leadership and the, the, the instructional staff, in uh, the school climate and culture has always been very positive when it comes to NAAC. Uh, so. When does that process conclude? 
research process. The NIASC accreditation. It's never ending. So um, this round of it. <laughs> so we're just starting. So uh, the build up of the steering committee, which is sort of a self study, uh, we're in neck deep in that right now. Uh, that will culminate with the visit in March uh, by the team. And uh, after their visit, they're going to uh, produce a report that will be voted on by uh, their commission. I believe it's in June, I believe. So we'll get the report over the summer. And then that starts sort of this 10-year cycle uh, where they come out. I think it's two years. They've changed it now, so uh, don't quote me. I think it's in two years they're going to come back out and sort of review our progress. And then it's a five-year, um, and then we start all over again. So are we committed for 10 years? It's an annual commitment. We pay an annual membership, so as a school district, we could opt out any time. But if the to fulfill the the ten year cycle, it's a ten year commitment. Okay. Um, I'm asking because we discussed this last year whether Correct. we wanted to continue with this, and I know the Northampton Public Schools does not do the NIAS. So currently, we are revisiting. The that is right now. We are not accredited by the NIAS. Well, I, um, what I'm wondering is at what point would it make sense to gather feedback from the people, the, from the key people in the process to ask for their experiences, to say, is it worth the time, is it worth the money, and if so, why, and if not, why not? I, I would be interested in that, because even if the dollars are minimal, it, it's absolutely staff helps, and is that the best way for you all to allot their time? I, I did. It is. Yeah, I, I did garner input from the staff. We had a survey right, I remember a couple that. years ago now, yeah. um, and there was a, there were some concerns. Um, I think people realize it's a lot of staff hours. You yeah. were correct. There's no way around that. Uh, the concern that was voiced and, and why we we said let's just stay in for the time being was, um, as a former school counselor, I know the the impact on college admissions for schools that are not accredited. There's minimal impact there, uh, so that sort of reassured our, our right. th that concern. But the other concern was from the vocational standpoint: uh, were there other vocational schools we pulled out, and we didn't have that data. Right. So we thought, for the time being, as a vocational school, it's right. We, and and I'm sorry, I'm not meaning to relitigate this at all. I am just, <coughs> I, I'm some some kind of program evaluation is what I would be interested in. So, when at the end, at whatever point when they get to the end of it their part to say like, okay, what did you think? So that you have that information to, uh, you know, not reflecting back on it, but right then to say, what, what are the possibilities? I'd say probably the five years, you know, these first five years are sort of working on the current plan, no. uh, what can we do for growth, and then sort of that second half of the cycle is more gearing up for the next cycle. So I think if we want to live through this, this cycle, I'd say five years. We're so we're essentially going to five years. At okay. this point, if I right. ask for a recommendation. Fair enough. And we did discuss this thoroughly. Right. Thank you. There will oh. be costs this year. There will be substantial costs. Uh, how many members are visiting? About eight? Uh, eight to ten. So there's eight to ten individuals visiting for two days. That's eight to ten hotel rooms. Yeah. That is eight to ten meals times three. Mm -hmm. uh, that's eight to ten mileage. Yeah. That's is a substantial cost in the district. Superintendent, are, are you also going to require us to be a part of the uh, March 2024 visit? So I know that sometimes there is uh, there's a team that wants us to meet the president. And so just to prepare you all for that, that meeting. Yes, so I know Bruce was mentioning sort of the, the different stakeholders. Uh, they're going to share that schedule, I think, after the new year. So once we have that, once we know who they want to talk to, we'll be sharing that. I'm sure the trustees will be on the list. Just prepare yourself. <laughs> All right. So we're currently committed for five more years, or are we committed into? every year? You, as a board of trustees, you could vote to pull out any year. Oh, okay. So when we had the discussion about the MASC, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the MCAS, yeah. um, and Mr. Parks gave his presentation about that, and and. You know, we know it's stressful to all the stakeholders, students, administration, teachers, and but yet my eyes were open through his uh, presentation about the data that we gather from it. So does this process also push us in a way to, to look at what we're doing and push us to do better? 
Yes, uh, to be fair to the NEAC, it does force us as a school community to come together, look at the, the competencies, self-assess how do we feel as a school are we doing to, towards those, and then it allows an outside, unbiased group to say, yes, we agree with you or not. Um, so there is some validity to that. I don't want to totally minimize NEAC. Uh, I think the difference is, again, before MGAS and before Ed Reform, there was no other show in town to review a school. So that's why NAAC had the power. Uh, and now I'm looking at poor, you know, Ms. Wanzik. Uh, when it comes to school accountability, that's her job. And it's just endless, the amount of DESE oversight that we have. Um, so there are other ways that we're held accountable. Um, and thank you, Ms. Wanzik, for leading those charges on the panel. All right. So essentially, you answered with that last comment, answered my question is how, if we pull out, how are we going to hold ourselves accountable? We have to because of this. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And then I just, a fun thing for instructional leadership, I love getting in, you know, I don't have enough time, uh, and I wish I had more opportunities to get in classrooms and shops, and I, I see criminal justice, you know, thank you to, to Ms. Marciniak, she's always running me down there for various activities, but, um, but this was this is an opportunity that Mr. Nevin and, and Mr. Ansbach do with the horticulture, specifically around exploratory. Uh, so the freshmen are assigned uh, into teams, and they they create a hardscape. So basically, a, a walkway, like a brick patio with a stone wall. Uh, they design it, they they implement it, and then as administrators, we go down there and judge it. So. Uh, it's a fun time, uh, and then I, I don't have it here, but a couple weeks ago we went down and we judged the juniors, and it was very telling. I wish I had like a, a pre and a post photo to show you as a board. Uh, it's, it's, it's evident that the students, back to learning and accountability, our students in the horticulture, they do learn, because you see the quality as a freshman in exploratory, and you see the quality when they did it again as a junior. Uh, it's night and day, uh, so that was a fun activity. So moving into management and operations, uh, this is where the, the majority of the report will be for obvious reasons, but just a couple updates uh, before we get into horticulture. On the 18th of October, uh, we met as a team with the companion animal construction team, so that's carpentry, plumbing, electrical, uh, Mrs. Smith and facilities, uh, and, and the administrators, just kind of seeing where we are with that particular project. Uh, so at this point, uh, plumbing and electrical are in there actively, uh, plumbing the building and, and pulling all the wires for electrical. And uh, at that point, even though initially we had a, a hopeful end date, anticipated end date of the end of this calendar year, that's not gonna happen. Um, you know, to be more realistic, probably the end of the school year. Uh, because again, we're dealing with, uh, it's a school and it's a teaching moment and student labor is slower than professional labor. So uh, I think we accept that as a school. I think they're doing a great job. Um, but it just it take, takes longer. So that, that's the bottom line. And then on, uh, soon after that, we met uh, more administrative staff with Ms. Fairman, uh, looking at the skills capital grants that we have open. You know, we have we, we call the smaller one. That's the 2.3 million. The larger one, the 5 million. And it's, there's a lot going on with those. And we just want to make sure we're on the same page as far as the current spending. Uh, what needs to be done as far as working with department heads to get uh, quotes and to get orders and so on and so forth. So it's a, an endless task to make sure that we're staying on top of managing those grants. So uh, we met a couple weeks ago. We are on, on task. Okay, we're not falling behind. We had a little hiccup with, with the state approving some expenditures. I think we're back on track there. So uh, green light. Just another management uh, you think about it as a school, you know, we have to have fire drills. And uh, I do want to thank the Northampton Fire Department. Uh, they had their our first drill back on uh, October 27th. It went well. And uh, it was nice, you know, with the new assistant principal, Mr. Clark. Uh, it's always nice to have a fresh set of eyes. Uh, and, uh, you know, realizing that as a fire drill, we do actually many individual fire drills. You know, we, we don't do one massive fire drill and all, all the buildings evacuate at once. We go building by building by building. Uh, so it's always nice to sort of reflect on that. And from a student's perspective, on the academic side, a student actually has the opportunity to participate in a fire drill multiple times, depending on the time of the day and the bell schedule. You know, I may be stuck in A building, oh, a fire drill. Then the bell rings, I move to C building, oh, a fire drill. And then, oh, I move to B building. So there's that possibility that a student on that one particular day is leaving his or her class multiple times. But it is what it is. Um, 
But now let's move into horticulture. Uh, the video I, I've shared with the, not shared, but verbally talked to the board about uh, the marketing video that SMMA uh, was producing, obviously, for their, their marketing and PR purposes, uh, but also knowing with, with our particular needs that we have here, uh, how do we find the money to build this horticulture building? So we all agreed that let's sort of produce this video uh, that could be twofold. One is for SMMA, they can use it for, for marketing. And the second purpose is, is for us as a school to showcase uh, the program, showcase the building, and showcase the need that we have, which is we need money. Um, so the video has been finalized. Uh, I did share it with the staff. Uh, we shared it with the, uh, the building committee earlier today, and I, I want to share it with you as a board officially. Uh, after tonight, it's game on. You know, we can push this out through social media, website, however we can get the word out. Uh, the one stipulation that we're working on, uh, SMMA, and talking to some of the professionals, they recommended, and I've been working with Ms. Fairman, trying to find an online donation platform that is streamlined and efficient and makes a lot of sense that we can add on a link or a QR code of some sort to the end of the video. So hopefully you have the emotional tie to the video, you're going to feel it, you're going to want to donate a lot of your money. Uh, and then we don't want to lose that interest by you moving away from the video. So we want to capture that, that emotional connection right then and there. So that would be the only additional ad that we have once we have that available. But without further ado, I'm going to... Six and a half minutes. <coughs> I tell people I died and went to heaven when I came here to this location. You know, I've worked in traditional schools all my career as a school counselor, as an administrator. When I came to Smith, I felt the connection. Uh, the students that we serve here, a lot of them are struggling. They're low income, perhaps they're special ed. Whatever the background, I hear story after story after story from families that their child didn't like school growing up, and then they came to Smith Vocational, and all they want to do is talk about school. And you know, there's that, that direct connection between the academic and the vocational hands-on experience. When they graduate, they go back to the local communities, that cycle of life follows. Uh, that's my why. It's seeing the, the eyes open up and that engagement and that smile and then seeing that they become productive citizens. I, I, I love it. I truly do. superintendent here at Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School. In fact, we're the oldest vocational school here in the state, and we're the oldest agricultural school in the country. So we have a lot of history, uh, dating back to 1908. Our mission, we serve about 50 to 60 different communities here in Western and Central Mass. There's only four ag schools in the state, so students will be on a bus for about an hour, hour and a half each way to come here. If you want to have a future in animal science or agriculture, you're coming here. The interesting thing about horticulture is that there's many concentrations within that one particular field. So we're actually standing inside the greenhouse, uh, so we're able to uh, teach our students around greenhouse management, teach them about hydroponics and, and aquaponics. Hydroponics is growing plants in water without soil. We raise lettuce, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, cilantro, basil, stuff like that. And then we have a regular greenhouse that we grow plants in, or we propagate and grow them in soil, and uh, we use those for our plant sale with the FFA in the springtime. We also have uh, what a lot of our students and staff call our forestry program. That forestry is actually part of horticulture. So our students are able to learn arboriculture skills, uh, which is very popular when it comes to the industry in Western Mass. We know we have a lot of forest uh, areas. So how do we manage those forests? Our students learn that. We climb trees, we prune trees, we plant, maintain trees. So this is work that they would do at people's houses, cities, parks. We don't have a lift truck. So we climb with ropes and saddles. We learned the knots on our own to climb, so we ran out of respect, so not just climbing trees. This is a fraction of what we do. In addition to that, they're exposed to large equipment. We have some tractors, we have some heavy equipment like skid steers, backhoe, front end loaders, excavators. As students learn to operate, maintain, they're able to get their hoisters license, their commercial driver's license, and a pesticide license. 
Uh, we also have the opportunity to give a culinary program. So where do all of our salad greens go uh, once they're harvested? They go to culinary. So then our culinary students are able to then learn how to prepare those from the farm to the table. So we truly have a front of the table initiative. Stuff like that that is used in the culinary department as well as the cafeteria? So it's the one particular program that offers so many different avenues for our students. Uh, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, we had a devastating fire and we lost the, the majority of this particular building. We did have part of the building burned down, we lost quite a bit of equipment. One of the spaces of the building that we lost was a classroom. So there's no dedicated classroom anymore. And I think it impacts the, the program long term. That's been the biggest challenge. Our students actually went up to the instructors after the fire and said, don't worry, we're going to be okay. We've had this vision uh, in expanding our agriculture program here on campus. So having that new building, it would mean everything. Uh, for our staff and our, our students. More current classrooms. Place for the simulators, like I was saying, that'd be pretty cool. Like, maybe a place for the greenhouse next to it. I would love a rock climbing wall. When it's snowing out or it's 20 degrees below zero, there's no climbing trees. Maybe a decent sized garage with our equipment so not uh, open. So we're hoping to have more of a, a year round experience for our students that way as well. Our governance model is quite unique. We're the only independent vocational school in the state. Most schools, are they belong to a local city or town, or there's a regional agreement that sort of oversees the governance of that particular school. We really don't have any of that. So the challenge is how do we raise enough money to build the building that our students deserve? But where does the money come from? That's the challenge. Hopefully senior year we'll have our new building. I did my mom's walkway, the brick laying that way from here, Mr. Nevin's bones. He's a really good teacher. He's funny, he jokes around, he's not too straight. All right. <laughs> We have very strong partnerships with local employers and local municipalities. We have very strong, rigorous academics for those students who want to go off to college. No matter what students want to do upon graduation, our job here at Smith is to open that door. By doing what we do, we train them to be able to be very skilled and master these skills that they would need in the industry, so it gives them that leg up. And also a lot of companies are looking for two or three years of work experience when they're hiring people, and our students have that when they leave because they're doing all of that here. I like to see our youth succeed. The aha moment of a student when the light bulb goes off and they understand something that they've been working hard at, struggling to get, all of a sudden they get it and they're like, oh wow, this is awesome. Seeing that one person succeed is what makes me come back every day. staff at SMMA. He uh, was born and raised in England and uh, met and married his wife over in England. They moved, uh, they were in the LA scene for many years. He was doing the freelance work out there. Uh, realized that that environment is not his personality. Uh, his wife was from the Boston area, so they moved back to Boston. And uh, he's a go-getter. He got a job at SMMA and that's what he does. He's a storyteller. Yeah, beautiful. Okay. I did speak to Sidebar. Uh, Mr. Bianco would be very happy. I did have a conversation earlier today with SNMA, uh, sharing how happy we are with this particular video. Uh, we've been talking about uh, promotional videos for the school, talking about the website, redesigning the website, and wanted to have some updated videos. Uh, sort of twofold. One is a promotional video that we use uh, when our counselors go down to middle school uh, to show them what we are as a school. And the second one, as we revamp the website, Having even a you know, 15, 20 second little videos of each of the shops. So you can imagine as a family, you know, what is automotive mechanics? Uh, you can click on that particular video, get a quick glimpse. Uh, so we're wondering if Lucas was, would be interested in that. So the action were, were pretty receptive with the conversation. So we may have Lucas out here again at some point. Awesome. Right. So moving on. So that's, again, I think a positive first step. We need to tell, tell our story, get the word out. 
So this slide you've seen in the past, I'm not going to go line by line, but this is our current revenue sources for the horticulture building rebuild. Again, $6 million total is what we have in hand. I just want to remind the board, um, as we go down this road and talk about finances and talk about overall costs, <coughs> and we'll talk about tuition revolving, and, uh, and that's sort of been our historical slush fund slash savings account. Uh, historically, since I've been here, you know, of Dallas at the end of the year uh, has been somewhere between one and two million, okay, ballpark. And uh, we are currently under a million uh, in that balance at this point with all the various projects that we've been doing uh, on site. The other thing is out of tuition revolving, uh, that is our money that we use anytime we have a skills capital grant. Uh, we have to sort of purchase up front, okay. We also typically use tuition revolving when it comes to in-kind donations back to the, the same skills capital grants. If we have to put money into the pot, that's where the money comes from. So we have to be cautious about that. We also have to be cautious because uh, the transportation contract for our Northampton students, uh, that comes out of tuition revolving. We can't have the tuition budget in our operating budget. So there's already uh, requests and obligations coming out of tuition revolving. But You'll see here the third bullet down, uh, the skills capital grant, the 600000 towards facility rebuild. Uh, this was the, the shell game that we spoke about soon after the fire. Uh, so again, pre-fire, the vision was to expand the animal science program. That was you know, revising, uh, renovating the animal science building, you know, the former GCC building, former uh, Park and Rec building, and then talking about uh, building the companion animal building. All of that was sort of our vision as a school. Um, and I was prepared to come in front of all of you as a board and ask for uh, the investment from tuition revolving. That was our plan. Uh, then the fire occurs. I talked to the state, uh, Bob LePage, uh, you know, the, the executive office of education, works underneath the secretary of ed. Uh, he said, Andy, you know, we have this grant coming out. Uh, why don't you go through this grant? So we talked about you know, what we can and can't use a grant for. We talked about the shell game. So we went the first grant specifically to support animal science, even though we got the grant really because we had a fire in horticulture. But to make all the pieces work, we had to apply that grant money to animal science, which would then free up, hypothetically, me to stand in front of you as a board to say that 600000 I wanted to use for animal science, we've now got animal science covered, okay? Let's use that 600000 for horticulture. So it, technically it's a shell game, but I just want to outline that. That, that may impact future conversations. The rest you've already seen, okay, and we've thanked the people over and over and over again. Uh, again, I, Mr. Bianca is sitting here, Ms. Sherry was here earlier today. Uh, without their work and without them writing those two grants, we are realistically talking about just over a million dollars that we have in revenue. Thank you to Sen Senator Comerford, thank you to Smith College, okay, but the bulk of that money, the bulk of the six million is coming from skills capital grants. Okay, so we are having a totally different conversation if we didn't have those. So let's talk about the updated estimate. So from the last meeting to tonight, uh, you know, we were pushing, I, I mentioned to the board last month, you know, we were looking, we're beginning to look into a metal prefab building design. We didn't have any estimates at that point. Uh, we do have an estimate. It came back last, last Thursday, and then from Thursday to today, we've been doing some more revisions, more revisions, even as of this morning, we're doing some more revisions. So what you see in front of you and what the, the audience sees up on the screen uh, I, I want to kind of break it down and have a conversation, but I, I want to try to be as transparent as possible. But um, towards the bottom of that spreadsheet, uh, not the way bottom, but you'll see a, a row that says total, and it's $6,784,955.56. That row, that is the all-in cost, the estimate, okay, there's a difference between estimate and cost. That's the current estimate. That includes all of the construction costs, that includes all of the general conditions costs, you know, sort of the cost of the operation, the construction phase. Uh, that includes all of the um, potential building permit insurances, so on and so forth. It also includes the soft costs that are overseen by our OPM, the Oper uh, Owner's Project Manager, that's Craig Wilbur. Uh, in, in the soft cost is his fee. Uh, it's also the architecture fees, we have to pay the architects. So all said and done, we are estimating the project to be about 6.7 million. But I want to be transparent for the board. In that figure, we have some contingency fees, we have some markups, because we are still early on in the phase. Okay? We are still in what the architects call SD, or schematic design. 
It's basically, let's come up with the idea, the design, sort of the visuals, you know, do we like this concept? Um, let's get an estimate on it. And once we feel as sort of the, the governing body, which is all of you as trustees, once we feel comfortable with it, any estimate you feel comfortable with, then the next phase is what they call a DD, which is design documents, I believe it is, okay? Um, and in that phase, that's where the actual design down to every nut and bolt is figured, okay? And that's where all those very minuscule but very important decisions have to be made in the actual design of the building. And then once that is approved by you as a board, then we begin to create the bid documents. We go out to bid, hire jump contractor, hire all the subs, and begin construction, hopefully, in the spring of 24. So I just want to highlight, <clears throat> hypothetically, this is fantasy land, this will never happen, okay, but I just want the board to, to truly have a, a true picture. Hypothetically, if SMMA, the design firm, if they hit a grand slam and their estimate is spot on, okay, they're not, okay, no, no issues, no increases between now and then, um, the bare minimum estimate at this point is that bottom row, that's that 5.9 million, okay? <clears throat> We have, the next row up, the total of contingencies slash escalations is 883,000. Almost 884,000 of the 6.7 is sort of the what if, okay? Uh, what if the costs go up? What if this or what if that? Uh, so we, we have to build that in. Uh, so I just want the board to know when we say 6.7, I am truly hoping we don't actually have to spend 6.7, but we have to sort of anticipate that. As we go through, the DD phase, those what ifs become knowns. Okay, uh, we can't know everything obviously until we break ground and start building a building. But uh, those unknowns become more known, which means we can begin to de to minimize some of those escalation and contingency fees. So uh, that's the numbers. I'll get more into the numbers in a second. I also want the board just to understand what this estimate includes. Now, what are we getting potentially? You saw sort of the visuals in the video. Uh, you saw those renderings. Now, if you were quick enough, you may have seen it went from like a still image and then something was added, okay? So the idea there was <clears throat> with this particular building, we cut that. Uh, we've actually cut out the greenhouse, the head house, and the classroom out of our original design. The thought is let's make it smaller, make it more economical, we can afford the building. Down the road, if we have the money eventually, then how can we easily expand? So that's what you saw that next slide, okay, shows you what it would look like if we added the greenhouse, added the headhouse, added it to the classroom. Uh, so it all ties in, it wouldn't look odd, it wouldn't look like, oh, they, they added an extension, you know, 10 years down the road. It looks like the original design. So what we'd be getting potentially for 6.7 million is two classrooms, the simulator room, teacher office space, two shop spaces, so basically two shops, the climbing structure, laboratories, and lockers. Now, somebody may say, well, what did you have originally before the fire? So what are you getting from pre-fire to now? And the concept is that we would not be demoing what we currently have. So the greenhouse, the head house, the classroom that we have remaining, and the garage, we are hoping that we can keep for the time being. Um, and get back to, if we're pinching pennies, why will we spend pennies on knocking down a building that we could potentially use for time being. So if we assume that we keep that space for the time being, we add the building that I just referenced, we will be gaining a classroom over what we had initially. We are gaining a simulator room, we never had a simulator room. We're gaining the climbing structure, which we never had internal, and we're gaining another garage bed. I say bays, actually two bays, you know, the, the shop. Uh, I put potential because if that's the case, we could talk as a board more, you know, with the administrative team how we use that particular garage, if it remains horticulture, whether we use it for other uses, you know, we'd have that, that discussion down the road. But I want the board to see what we're getting, what the estimate is. Uh, now moving on, <clears throat> this might be worth some discussion I'd be looking for. It's super helpful that you pulled those out. Yeah, I, I think I, I needed to see it for myself, yeah. and I felt as a board I think we needed to see. So just as a quick summary, one slide, uh, again, overall revenue that we have, available revenue at this, at, at this point is just north of six million. The potential cost, as you can see, the range is anywhere from that 5.9 up to 6.7. Again, this is the estimate during SD. That means that there's a difference, okay? What is that gap? Well, potentially we have enough money. Potentially we have 124,000 in the black. 
or potentially we're short upwards of $758,000. Still better than the potential two, four, six million that we've been talking about over the last few, few months. Um, but there's no guarantee that we're meeting that six million that we currently have, okay? Uh, at this stage, I'll get back to that in a moment. So how do we potentially close this, this potential difference? We may not have a gap, you know, we may have enough money. Um, I know we've talked as a board of, with fundraising, uh, you know, with the video, we want to push the, the video out, we want to try to garner any interest. Um, my personal and professional recommendation when it comes to fundraising is that the fundraising perhaps is applied to necessary revisions, updating of that current facility and or the larger picture that we have around the ag complex. So all of you know, we're building the Campaign Animal Building. We want to look at equine in the, in the near future. There is many other additions in the animal size agriculture complex uh, that fundraising would definitely be beneficial. Uh, I just fear if we slow this project down because we want to fundraise for it, we're losing more time than we have those grants that have to be spent. So we have a very clear deadline. So I just want to caution the board uh, that I wouldn't necessarily recommend that we count on fundraising to fund this particular building. There's plenty of need that we have, uh, even within horticulture, if not animal science, for fundraising. So I encourage us to look at fundraising, but maybe not for this specific need. Tuition revolving account, I already mentioned you know, a few moments ago, that is out there, okay, and you know, as we build a budget, you know, we try to, to be conservative in, in the number of students that we have. We try to put money into tuition revolving every year. Um, so push comes to shove. If we were short, could we dip into tuition revolving for a little bit? Perhaps, I can't guarantee that, and that's why I wanted to really highlight under the revenue slide, you know, this only works if we're taking $600,000 out of tuition revolving from the get-go. How much more can we dip into tuition revolving to close any gap? I don't have that answer for you. And a bond. I've heard the bond as, a, as an option. Um, I just want to throw out some numbers. Uh, I want to thank Ms. Fairman, who unfortunately cannot be here tonight. Um, I'm not sure if the mayor is aware of some of these conversations, but okay, good. Um, so, Ms. Fairman reached out to Charlene, already the city finance director, uh, to say hypothetically, okay, uh, what would these numbers look like if we were, initially, the, that, that conversation at that level, we were talking about a $2 million bond, to be totally transparent. Uh, what would a 20-year bond look like, okay, at sort of the, the going rate that the city could receive for that bond? And uh, for a $2 million bond, for 20 years, the annual payment was about $155,000, okay? Now through more work with SNMA, I don't think we're gonna be needing $2 million, okay? So what you see on the slide, I just took those numbers and sort of, you know, using proportions, and what would a $750,000 bond look like? So these are total estimates, okay? I just wanna give the board an idea the $750,000 bond for 20 years at the 4.75% is approximately $58,000 would be an annual cost, okay? That breaks down to $4,800 a month. I know through the conversations with you know, the business administrator and, and finance director at the city, chances are if a bond was on the table, I would assume, I'm not the mayor, I'm not the city council, I'm only assuming that the obligation to pay that bond back would be on the lapse of Smith Vocational, okay? I would encourage the board to have a conversation about that, uh, but if I assume correctly, if that bond was our responsibility, how do we pay potentially a $4,800 monthly bill? Uh, the cell tower up at the forest, we receive revenue for that cell tower, it's approximately $2,000 a month. So my point is, cell tower alone, would not pay for a $750,000 bond. But could the combination of cell tower revenue, could some coming out of tuition revolving, could some out of our budgeting every year, okay, as we build a school budget, I don't want, I know Mr. Bianca's gonna look at me cross-eyed because I, I've been saying this for many years. Our operating budget is gonna begin to get more level, okay, because our student enrollment is not going up anymore, which means the only increase in our budget is the increase in non-resident tuition rate, and that's been typically one and a half to three percent a year. So for us to sort of pull more money out of the operating budget to pay for this bond may not be wise educationally. Trying to be 
honest with the board. But there might be ways to sort of close that gap if we had to, if we have a gap. Uh, before I talk about my recommendation, I just open it up to the board. Thoughts, questions, concerns, then I'll bring in what we talked about earlier today. But I just want the board to be understanding sort of where we are financially at this point. I have um, some thoughts and questions. You know, when I hear $58,000 a year, I think that's an, an educator, potentially. It's about three students when it comes to non resident tuition. Yeah. Um, More than three. And is that how we want to spend our money? On, you know, increased square footage for this building, which is already more than what we had, which is one shop out of 15, and the other 14 shops are in not great condition, I would say, in my own professional judgment, and all of the academic departments. So it's, there's a potential inequity there that, I, that concerns me a little bit, or the perceived inequity. Um, so <coughs> I'm thinking about that. The cell phone tower revenue goes somewhere now, so it could break it down. have to come away from whatever it's going to now to go toward, it's not just sitting, uh, you know, not, so I'm thinking of that, and I'm also wondering, I, I've never known a project in all my life, a building project that came in on budget, you know, of course it's going to be over budget, and it's probably going to be over budget for a lot, because the pricing pieces we've seen recently are unlike anything, you know, in recent history. Um, is is working within the what I consider to be a very generous budget we have is that at all an option or is that no longer an option? The six million. Yeah. <coughs> I think if, I think if the board says six million is six million and you make it work, we have to make it work. Can we make it work? Uh, so the building committee we had a very lively discussion earlier today, um, and. Some of the questions that we were talking about, as one example, this is a metal prefab building. We also did part of the estimate was a traditional wood build. Okay, so not as fancy as the CLT, which is what we were talking about for a few months. This is just traditional how we're building the campaign animal building, that same model. Um, you know, what would that cost be? Uh, it's like a hundred thousand dollar difference. Uh, there's discussions around the heating systems and radiant heat in the floor, and uh, th there's many nuts and bolts types of questions that we have to have answered. Uh, which could raise or lower the estimate. I know there's questions that came from the building committee that some of the estimate they feel is high. Uh, there's certain lines, like the general conditions line. Uh, people on the committee felt that was an overestimate. So we won't know that until we get into the DD phase. Um, do I think at the end of the day, if I was told as a superintendent, you have $6 million, make it work? Obviously, we'd make it work. Um, would it require Outside the box thinking, would it require c cutting back a little bit more? Maybe. I, I, I don't have that answer for you, unfortunately. Um, I feel more comfortable today than I did last Thursday. And the three of you were with, were with me last Thursday at the conference when we received the news. Uh, I was not a, a happy man then. Um, what, what I'm looking at today is more realistic. Uh, I think we're there. Um, which, I'll put it out there to the, to the board, and, and the building committee agreed. My recommendation is that we spend a year and a half going through a feasibility study. Now we're into this schematic design phase. We, we're at the point now where we're, I told the building committee, we're, we're within a ballpark, and it might be a little league ballpark at this point. It's relatively small. We're pretty close. Um, I don't know how much more we can spend during the schematic design phase because it's still kind of a hypothetical. Um, I feel comfortable and the building committee felt comfortable for the board to discuss, and you see my recommendation, um, allow SMMA to move into the design document phase, I, if I'm saying the DD correctly, DD phase. Design <laughs> development. Development, thank you. Which is really giving us a hardcore design, the blueprints. It's, this is the building and this is what it's going to cost, but we have to go out to bid. So even then, there's some flexibility. Um, the timeline, according to the SMMA timeline, if you as a board vote tonight to allow SMMA to move into the DD phase, the DD phase is supposed to take through the month of December, which then means in January, they're coming back to us as a board with the design documents, okay? That it's official, here's the building, we're going either metal building, we're going to wood building, 
we're doing this heat or that heat, this is it. As a board, in January, late January, you're making a decision, you're okay. If we go through that phase and we're still over budget, if the six million is the six million, it's during that phase that we say we have to cut this out, we have to cut that out. Um, it would give us a clearer picture to make those decisions. Um, as I told the board, uh, the building committee earlier today, I felt uneasy as a superintendent to stand in front of you as a board and ask that question, to vote to move to DD when we had an estimate of 10 to $12 million. There was no way I could see us through DD going from 10 to 12 million down to 6 million. That, I think it would be unethical of me to ask you as a board to move into the next phase. Uh, I think we're, so, we're close enough where I think by us moving into DD, we can clarify things more. And you'll sleep at night between now and January. A little bit more, but I'll sleep when the building is opened. Uh, um, Thank you for that answer. Sorry, I wanted to ask another question about the fundraising. Um, because I'm not understanding this. We were a public school. We're funded by public tax dollars. Um, I don't, like, I'm trying to think of all, well, all that I know about public education of examples where public schools raise private funds at this level for, a, you know, capital expenditure. And all I can come up with is charter schools. Um, so if, it, and it was, is that, what you're proposing that we sort of use that model of we've got to turn to the private sector to fund this public good and um, are there precedents in vocational schools for this kind of fundraising because maybe it's just like I know pub I know district schools I know charter schools I know private schools um, it, vocational schools there is a precedent I can, I, I can think of one clear example I went and visited. How realistic is it to think we're going to come up with a half a million dollars for the private sector? So, in your answer, you visited I, Tech. I, I, I visited Monty Tech Monty. Uh, up in Pittsburgh. <clears throat> so, Monty Tech's story is um, they wanted to create uh, a vet tech program, uh, as many folks schools are trying to, trying to create. So, the superintendent went to her school committee, to regional school, 19 communities. So, there's 19 various people sitting around the table and she uh, proposed adding this program, which would require a new facility. And the school committee told the superintendent, great idea, you can have it, but we're not paying for it. So she had to sell fundraise. Now, this was many years. Uh, you know, we have a decision to make in like a month. Um, but she had many years, and there was many different fundraising opportunities. There was bring your pet in for, you know, they had a photo booth in, in during lunch, and they, you know, the student could bring the dog in and take a picture, and, you know, that raised money, okay? She had all kinds of fundraising. It was about $2.3 million for that project. But again, that was several years ago. Uh, I was there because it was the open house. I went, that building today would not cost $2.3 million. Uh, it's nice that they're proposing uh, for this particular program. So it is out there. Uh, there is that model. And again, I just want to remind the board, I didn't show as other options, uh, but to be totally transparent for the community, Another option to use public money is the, uh, the capital expense assessment that's on the regulations. That's where we apply, you know, whatever that balance is. If we're looking for a million dollars, you know, we could divide that million dollars up in our tuition bill and send those out to the, the city communities. Um, I feel comfortable doing that because we're talking back to the point. We have one, this is one program, and many small communities may not have students in that particular program at this moment. So why should they be paying for this particular the building. On top of another point you made, which is we have a larger school that we have to manage, and we have a larger building that is in dire straits. And I would recommend that we deal with that regulation for that particular building. Uh, MSBA, I mean, I'll, I'll just keep talking. If you haven't heard of MSBA out of my mouth, uh, MSBA, the Massachusetts School Building Authority, uh, that's sort of the public way of public schools to get money for a building. Uh, and that question came up today afterwards. And uh, that would require the city of Northampton because they are really our resident community. Uh, the city of Northampton would have to sign off on that, uh, which means the taxpayers in Northampton are paying that portion of that particular uh, agreement. Um, and the reimbursement rates nowadays are not the 70% that the school had many years ago. That's off the table. You know, like, we'll be lucky if there's a 50 to 55% reimbursement rate. That's probably more realistic. And we'll um, be in a long line. They are very long, last many years. So, just the, the grant money goodbye, uh, 
So that's why I'm, I'm trying to be real as far as you know the options. I think our hands are beginning to get tied, and every passing day they get tied tighter and tighter and tighter. How did we they get from 7.4 last Thursday to 5.9? Yep. So <clears throat> we went through every single we a lot of value engineering and cutting stuff out. Yes. And Literally a big part of it, Julie, is 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 taking this piece off and as future expansion, which I would love not to do that, but right now the dollars aren't allowing it and I'm sitting here going, we have opportunity to move forward and build a new facility. I know it's only for one program, but we need to start somewhere. And we're, we're doing it with Animal Companion in-house, thankfully, are able to do it in-house and there's then discussion, what can we do in the house on this project? And, and that's going to be part of the future discussions as we move forward. Because um, so, if, we, if we don't do that piece, you know, in fu future expansion, and this is, we had a grand wish list that was too grand, yeah. and, and we got the reality check. So, I would love to be able to see this built, and I would push for that. But again, I'm going to be a realist and, and hear all the facts. And um, what my point of view is, we need to start moving forward in some way. And yes, it is for one program, but then we got to start looking at all the other programs and do what we can as we can, and we got to. I think if we start somewhere, we can hopefully the snowball will start rolling and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But there, there are a lot of ifs, no doubt about it. And and we don't know the reality of the cost until it goes out to bid. It's it's you know they're doing their homework, they're doing their budget estimates. Um, there's questions on on some of the costs and. Uh, I plan to reach out to my network on some of this stuff and see what type of feedback I get on, on, on the current market. Um, so. so how we were able to reduce it from Thursday to today. Um, one example is by removing the head house. Um, the head house on Thursday, the head house, greenhouse, and classroom were already out. Okay? Uh, so that number I saw Thursday still didn't include those. But it's still included, as an example, a three-bay sink. Because the three-bay sink was like line by line. It's, I have, uh, you know, the estimate is a, it's a thick document. Um, it is literally line by line of every furnishing, every sink, every toilet, so on and so forth. So in the estimate, there was still a three-bay sink as an example. Uh, I know it's a small example. Yeah. But by removing the head house, then there's no need for a three-bay sink. So they went through literally and pulled everything out that would have come out. That lowered it. They also worked with Berkshire Design, which is the, the, design, the design firm looking at all the site prep work. And uh, you know what can we do site prep work to minimize some of the cost. So they were able to reduce it by over $100,000. So a little here, a little there. Uh, what we see tonight I think is more accurate, but again, it's still schematic design. Um, st student labor. So. One of the estimates, because uh, we, we've had this conversation behind, uh, behind the scenes, why can't we go to electrical and plumbing and do some of the work in-house? We're doing that for the Capena Animal Building. Um, the, the labor involved that we could save is about $42,000, okay? I'm not sure if that's a lot or a little. Depends on your perspective, okay? If we're talking about how do we potentially close a gap of several hundred thousand, 42000 isn't a very big drop. In talking to those two shops, um, there are some serious concerns for us to take that, that job on. Uh, timeline, I don't know if we could meet the timeline. Uh, liability, we are opening ourselves up. Are opening ourselves up to bidding with other subcontractors who are aware that we, you know, our students are doing electrical work and plumbing work and how does that timeline impact their work. Um, those two shops said thanks but no thanks, we would not want to be part of it. We would not be able to hire them over the summer, because again, back to timeline, um, it's illegal for them to work over the summer because then it, they turn into prevailing wage employees and there's other layers of paperwork that they go through. So 
we'd simply be talking about the school year. We're talking about students. Um, it's a great idea, but I would. Doesn't fit the academic program. If for forty-two thousand okay. dollars, and you know, talking, Mr. Bianco was talking to both department heads. They feel that that forty-two thousand dollars savings could actually, in a way, turn into an added expense. So we may not actually have a savings. We might be spending more money if we go with the student aid. So. On the um, on this slide, it says recommend a vote to approve SD estimate as shown in the project to be phase. So that's your wording. And did you? Um, did you go into the building committee meeting with that recommendation and present it to them and get their feedback, or did you have the building committee meeting and then come back and put this in the slide? Yeah, I, I did not show that to them ahead of time. So the building committee, again, was very lively. Um, very lively. And then it got into a point where how much more can we spin our wheels? Mm -hmm. uh, they feel that we're pretty close, um, and there was actually kind of two discussions slash votes at the end. One was um, the traditional stick build, the wood build versus metal building. Uh, and there was sort of a, a consensus, but it wasn't universal, and you'd be surprised who voted which way. It was like a straw poll. A straw poll That's on what? Their advisory. Correct. Yeah. Between metal and wood. Right. And then the second was what well, I wanted, because I knew what I was proposing. I wanted to hear from the building committee. As a building committee, do you feel comfortable if the board votes to move to DD or are we so far out there that we're not ready for that? And that was universal. Now we're ready to move to DD. Allow SMMA to move to DD. So that is there. That, that wasn't even consensus. That was universal. So that was the end. We're going to bring this question forward later in here. Uh, my own personal feeling is that we've captured that $6 million and we've been holding on to it since the fire or since the grants were given to us. It's time to release some of those funds to get this process started for the DD part of it. So, uh, like I said, we're going to bring this under a motion and uh, everybody can have their uh, say on it at that time. Yeah, I was getting more information. Yeah. Okay. Uh, family and community engagement. So, again, just quickly. Not in the packet, it's up on the PowerPoint, but you'll see, in the packet you see the link, but uh, up on the screen is the November newsletter that went out. Uh, this month's sort of focus between myself and Mr. Bianca was the advisories. Uh, they're sort of on the heels of the board of advisory meetings that we had recently. Uh, and just sort of talking to the community about the importance of the program advisories. Why do we have them in Chapter 74? What's the benefit of them? Um, and then as you can see, uh, Mr. Bianca continued on the conversation, and then we had some other updates from around the school. So again, that went out on November 1st. Okay. And speaking of the advisories, back to the PowerPoint. I'll get into that in a moment. Actually, the next slide is about advisories. But uh, Mr. Kaylane and I, on the 24th, we went to the Northampton Lions Club. Uh, they had a meeting. It was a presentation. We did a presentation. I had dinner with them. I thought it was very successful. They had some great questions. Uh, a lot of interest in the school and what we do. So. Uh, between PR and just again sharing information, I think that was a, a worthwhile evening. Uh, the Good Dog Spot, uh, this was a, a telephone call uh, that we had, but uh, I just want to highlight sort of again that community involvement, the company involvement. So, back at Campaign Animals, you know, we've hired an instructor who came from Ag Mech. Uh, she has background in small animals, but we wanted to make sure that she is up to speed when it comes to best practices when it comes to a uh, like a doggy daycare, doggy salon, grooming facility. <coughs> Uh, Good Dog Spot has two, two facilities. One happens to be in Northampton. Uh, so we had a, the, a conversation. We've actually set up an, an externship, in essence, uh, where this particular instructor, over the course of five weeks, will be spending uh, a school day uh, down at the Good Dog Spot, observing and sort of taking notes and pictures and, and gathering those best practices. So when the Campaign Animal Building is up and running with grooming, she has, has all those best practices. So uh, I think that was a great meeting and hopefully a great connection, talking about co-ops down the road. Uh, so that's a great relationship. I already mentioned program advisories that we had on the 25th. I, I thought that was a great evening. I like the model that we have as the administrative staff and, and uh, as the Board of Trustees breaking ourselves into two different teams. We go through sort of you know, half the shops each. In the springtime, we'll let them, you know, as an individual administrator or a trustee of the opportunity to see all 15 programs. Uh, but that was a great night. Uh, the middle school counselor tour and luncheon, this happened about a week ago. 
I participated because the interim superintendent for East Hampton uh, was here as well. Uh, she was a long-term superintendent in Worcester for many, many, many years. Uh, she retired and now she is an interim superintendent, kind of bouncing around a little bit. She's in East Hampton most recently. Uh, she and I had some great conversations. We promised to, to follow up. Uh, we did follow up the very next day. We had the, the superintendent luncheon at the Delaney House. We're talking about long-term the relationship between Smith Vocational and uh, East Hampton. Uh, so I don't want to share too much, uh, but I, I think that conversation has started. We'll see where it goes, uh, but there's some positive movement there uh, at the superintendent level. Uh, but we know that you know, there's always, always a mayor and school committee involved as well with any potential decision making. But we do have a very strong supporter as a superintendent. Here. Can I loop in Dr. Bonner since she might not have the history that um, East Hampton uh, used to send all of their students who were interested in vocation, one, one year, so vocational education to Smith Oak. Um, and then at a certain point, Dr. Lincoln Huckle will know exactly when that point is, what year it was, but they made the decision to send their students to CTEC, which is part of the Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Collaborative. So they keep their, East Hampton High School keeps their students for half the day, and then they eat lunch at the high school, and then they go to CTEC for half a day. and. There are definitely, like, uh, it was to save money, right, because they pay for out of district tuition plus transportation costs. Um, so they were saving some money, and they uh, make, make sense from a budgetary reason, and definitely lots of families in East Hampton who would prefer for their students to come here to Smith Vocational. So it's, it's kind of a complex issue, but I, I know I lament their having left, because there are, right, next city over and a natural fit. And, there's some of their students do come here for programs that CTEC doesn't offer. So, the, the biggest thing, if I may. Yeah, I was just going to say, Dr. Lincoln Hooker is building some bridges. Is, is, that, is that it's not apples for apples comparing what they're getting for learning experience because it's only half the time, the other half they're on a bus. <clears throat> or the other half, they're getting their academics <coughs> at East Hampton, then they have to go down to West Springfield to get the small amount of vocational which is less hours because, again, they're bus down, they're bus back. So <clears throat> even though East Hampton says it costs us less money than coming to Smith School, yeah, it does, but you're not getting apples for apples well, on the education. I think Andy also pointed out to them the transportation costs and the, right. the other soft costs that you don't necessarily see. And, and uh, but there's costs associated the, to The other point, um, they're not getting as a focused education as what we can give them here, because it's shop one week, academics one week, so you're concentrating on one thing each week as opposed to back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So that's what Andy's been trying to sell. Right, the counter argument is, uh, the claim is that they have the same amount of instruction at CTEC because they actually meet every day and we meet every other week. Um, it's not, it doesn't equal, we still have more time. It um, but it's close. It. Uh, but more importantly, the quality of the, of the education, I always use uh, advanced manufacturing as an example. So it may take a student two or three hours to set that one machine up to do a part. Um, well, that two or three hours at CTEC, that's, that's your day. Uh, so then they have no time to actually make the product. Uh, whereas Smith are in school the entire day. Uh, so the quality. We hear it from the employers, uh, especially the, the manufacturing employers, that students coming from Smith, uh, sort of that dedicated time on learning, you can imagine as adults, you know, that work ethic, uh, being able to focus on a task for six hours is different than focusing on a task for three hours. So our students are better prepared for the workforce because they're on it all day long. So there's, there's pros, you know, we'll see where it goes. Thank you. I just want to update the board. I know last meeting uh, there was uh, public discussion. I just want the board to know that we did meet uh, with that particular basketball program. Uh, we had a very professional, uh, courteous meeting, and I think we hashed out any of the concerns that were that, that were raised. So I think we're good there. So just letting the board know that. And then uh, I don't want to steal Mr. Bianca's thunder, but uh, he'll talk about open house and all the all the data around open house. I just want to say it was a great day. Thankfully, Mother Nature was nice to us. It was a nice day out. Um, the numbers were down a little bit, but as far as just overall feeling, I thought it was a great day. Uh, so I, I promised I wanted to talk about program advisory membership. Uh, I mentioned this at, at the beginning of that particular evening. I was talking to all the advisories and, you know, 
the advisories work back to accountability, uh, one of the questions that we had earlier. Uh, one of the levels of accountability that we have through DESE is the membership of our program advisories. So they have a, a spreadsheet of all the de different demographics that we have to meet for every single advisory. So it's not just having three, four individuals, it's each individual has to meet a certain demographic. As an example, a parent, a student, uh, a, a racially minority uh, minus uh, individual, uh, somebody with a disability, uh, post-secondary, uh, union, if we have a union in that particular industry. So there's different pieces that we have to sort of check out. The challenge is, as a department head, you, you work your tail off to get as many people as you know to be on your advisory, and you may be striking out. You may not know somebody who meets one of those uh, one of those needs. But then we don't talk to the other advisory members and, and the, other, the other programs. So the thought was, can we begin to sort of push out there and through the board, this is what I'm doing tonight. I just want to highlight some of the needs that we have in particular programs. You have your connections in the community, you may know somebody. Uh, and this is what we were talking about at the advisory evening. That I may be a machinist, I might be in, on the advanced manufacturing advisory, but you know, my best friend, well, my neighbor is a nurse. Uh, but if I had no concept that health tech was struggling to find somebody, I, would, I wouldn't know that and I wouldn't talk to my neighbor. Um, so we want to sort of get the word out and hopefully help each other. So you see the list, uh, I, I'm not going to rattle it off here, you have it in front of you, but uh, we do have a few shops that are still working on the list, so this is not completely, uh, totally comprehensive, but I think we're missing four or five shops. But for the most part, you see the the uh, openings that we have for the particular shop. Thank you so much for doing this because it gives us a chance to, you know, take a minute to use our connections in the community, right? Correct. Um, animal science, organized labor, what? That is not one I would think of for organized labor. And they may not have organized, they may not have a union, but. Gotcha, but they, they still they have to, the, so every single if they shop can, has to. Okay, got it. Thank and you. again, one thing that you know, we work with our department heads, mm -hmm. You don't need an individual that meets one. If one individual may check off multiple boxes. Then that works. That works. Great. Okay. Thank you. This is wonderful. Okay. Any other questions around that? I think the last standard is uh, professional culture. Just a few updates. Uh, I went back in October to the, the MABA board in general meetings. Just There's a breakout session I wanted to, to let all of you know. I already spoke to Lorena. Uh, it was a great CTI program update and best practices. CTI is the Career Technical Institute, sort of the initiative that Governor Baker had on how to create these evening programs uh, for adults. Uh, we have a CTI program here in uh, our culinary program. You heard that from Lorena uh, recently. And it was interesting to talk to, not talk to, but listen to the other vocational programs that have CTI programs and some solutions that they've had to some common problems. Uh, I don't think this is a solution for us. I think Mr. Smith would, again, throw tomatoes at me, but one issue that uh, they had was sort of the use of space. And there's always a challenge, you know, during the, the school year, that shop is being used for that particular shop. So then how do we sort of play nice in the sandbox and have a separate program in that same space at night? It causes challenges if you can think about the logistics behind that. This one particular school, they solved their problem, it works for them, their CTI programs are during the summer. Uh, so they, they do everything over the summer, uh, and it, it avoids the school year uh, sch scheduling nightmare. I don't think that would work for us, because you know, most of our maintenance and repairs and updates and cleaning happens over the summer, so how would that work? Um, so that's just one example. Uh, it was great. I, I, I really took a lot out of that, that particular workshop. The next one I just want to talk about. Excuse me. What does the I stand for again in CTI? Career and Technical Institute. Okay. Thank you. In that particular program, the students, uh, they don't pay anything. It's all grant funded. So the grant money yeah, comes yeah. Through, the, you know, through us and then, yeah. Uh, the next one on the 27th I went to, this was the follow up to the middle school counselor at a luncheon. Uh, the very next day, uh, I went to the luncheon. I sat with the East Hampton interim superintendent, continued the conversation. Uh, but I just want to let the board know that we had representation from MAASS and MAAC. Uh, and they were talking, really their focus was on uh, the current topics at the state house and uh, you know, advocacy issues uh, for all of us. So it, it was a worthwhile uh, presentation. And then lastly, I'm not going to belabor the fact, you know, but several of us were down at the Cape last week for the joint conference. My big takeaways were uh, the legal update session. Uh, I sort of joke, uh, it's always nice to be in a legal update session and one of the examples is not Smith. Uh, so we did not make the PowerPoint, which was nice. 
sweating. Correct. <laughs> um, I was sweating. It was a very hot room, but uh, that's okay. In a couple of days, I'll be going with, with Ms. Wanzik and, and a couple others to another legal update uh, session at the log cabin, so uh, which is always good. Another session has already been shared about the Bob of Legislative Advocacy. Uh, I do, I, I spoke to Charlie uh, from Nishoba Tech, he is the new Division 8. Uh, he has a lot of great ideas. I've already offered Smith Vocational as a host site uh, for a Western Mass meeting for Division 8. Uh, and Anthony Adelha, who's the, the lobbyist, is excellent. Uh, if you ever want to learn about state politics and what's going on in the State House, listen to Anthony for an hour. He's, he is wonderful. Uh, well, I guess I love the legal update so much I put it twice. I love it. And then lastly, the, the AI presentation. Uh, I, I, I won a second and third, sort of that, that was the last day, the last presentation I attended. And I, I got a lot out of it. I just want to say this, I, I know we're way over, but uh, I think this is worthwhile. I went into AI, and I know what AI is. I've used AI, honestly. Um, I think it's a great resource if used properly. But I went into it thinking it's basically this technology that goes out and surfs the web, all kinds of literature, all kinds of books, all kinds of whatever, almost like a Wikipedia on steroids. You know, when you put a prompt in to say, please give me, you know, whatever, it kind of gathers all that information and spits it out in its own words. But in a way, it was kind of plagiarism, okay? Uh, that's not how AI works. That is not, which shocked me. Uh, how AI works is that it goes out and it reads all the literature out there, okay? Uh, and it gathers, but it doesn't know what this word is or that word is, okay? It's literally a numbers game. So the word professional, okay? Yeah, Andy, Andy, maybe you need to uh, fine tune that. It was more, what you're getting at was the, the more the chat GPT. Correct. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. What I think AI is not cool. necessary. Okay. Yeah. I, I think at the school level, one of, I think our big concern locally as a school is the chat GPT. It's, Students going home and typing in their homework question or essay prompt, and they're getting their essay written on it. So I just want, I learned a lot of what that essay is. That essay that's given is not ChatGPT going out to Wikipedia and all these you know, primary sources and gathering information and saying, here's your answer, okay? All it's doing is, you know, professional. It knows every piece of literature out there that's been published how often professional has been listed. And then it knows the probability of the very next word, what comes after professional. And it lists all of those words. So all that Jet, chat GPT is doing is saying, okay, professional, what, is it, what, what, what are the odds of the next word? It spits it out. Now it knows that word. It knows the combination of those two words. What, what are the odds of the next word? It's simply predicting what the next word is. All the technology is doing, okay? It gives you whatever the writing assignment is that way. How it works, and this is what's a little scary, the scientists and the researchers and the engineers have no idea how it works, really. But it works, okay, for the most part. <clears throat> sort of the, the comic relief, and this, and this is what I want to put out there as sort of the caution for people, is that it's not accurate because it's not plagiarizing necessarily. It's not going and finding the answer and giving you the answer. It's simply a numbers game. So the example that the professor used in the MIT was, uh, you know, you can kind of joke about his freshman students in front of you. You can kind of visualize the freshman students at MIT, and you can stereotype about how they are, the lack of social skills that they may have. So they had a writing prompt of, what is the school mascot? What is the MIT school mascot? That was his writing prompt. <clears throat> Chat GPT spit out like a three-paragraph essay on the MIT mascot, which is the beaver. Uh, and the first two paragraphs were accurate. It talked about why MIT has a beaver, it's industrial, it's engineer, so on and so forth. It was great. It was all very accurate. The last paragraph, though, talks about the freshman orientation program at MIT and talks about, uh, it's sort of like this rush week, basically, and how classes, they have different competitions, and some of the competitions have different races and this and that. That's all inaccurate. That doesn't happen. But what happened was, GP, Chat GPT was talking about orientation, and then what are the odds? And it starts piecing together this paragraph that when you read it, is totally false. It does not happen. It looks real. It looks real. It sounds cool. The freshman students in, at the MIT classroom are like, did I not get invited to this, this orientation? 
Um, it just doesn't exist. So I, that's the caution, which was fascinating. Um, I'll stop talking about it. But I just that was my big takeaway uh, with AI. It's very it's interesting. I think it can be very useful, but we have to be cautious of what it's producing. And for, for me, the most alarming aspect of it is all, all of that, um, you know, all of, all of the, everything that it's surveying for frequency is all um, biased. It's, I mean, it's, it's largely produced by men and white people. And so you don't get so more, re re just because it is that numbers game. So you go all the way back through history, it's like, oh, it's overwhelming. This, it's, so it's reproducing these systemic inequities. How, can't, can't we program it to stop that? But why, when I shuffle my songs, I always hear the same song. It's like, why does the algorithm do that? Why won't it let me hear all of the songs I want to listen to on my own phone? You know, but it, it thinks it's, it just goes with the numbers. It's annoying. Right. We have one donation. Uh, just moving on, I'm sorry. Uh, David Devine, who is the, the spouse of, of Ms. Devine, one of our school counselors, uh, who works over at Massachusetts Message Coding. Uh, they donated 120 cases of disposable culinary. <coughs> But the fact is, uh, culinary will be uh, handing those out to other shops that may need them. So uh, thank you to, to Mr. Devine. And looking ahead, I just a couple of things I want to point out. I already mentioned it, Ms. Weinzick, myself. Uh, Mr. Clark will be attending the school uh, update at the Lock Cabin on Thursday. Uh, on Friday, we have uh, our first policy subcommittee meeting to sort of brainstorm. As you know, that's one of our priorities is to kind of review the policy manual and some of the hot topics. Um, I don't know if I'm still invited, uh, but hopefully next week I might be at this. Are we still doing Shark Tank next week, or is that going to uh, Shark Tank, they were actually way ahead of the game, so you missed it, sir. I missed, okay, so I won't be there next week. <laughs> uh, but then we have the Thanksgiving break next week, so there's no school Wednesday through Friday, uh, and then we have ACT the following week. Uh, I, I also want to let the, the board know, on what's, Monday... What's ACT? The American... Uh, CTE, so it's, it's our national association when it comes to CTE and career and technical education. So on that Monday, December 4th, Max Page, who is the, uh, the MTA president, that's the state union, uh, will be here on site. Uh, his day job is uh, a professor over at UMass, and uh, thank you to Dr. Spencer Robinson reaching out and making that connection. Uh, so he'll be here uh, touring the campus talking. Uh, I think it's a, a, an opportunity for Max to, to see what we do as a vocational school and see that student engagement and interest is pretty high at a, at a vocational school. So he, know. he testified before the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education on the um, how important it was to focus on joy in schools, in learning. And I thought, he has to come to Smith Vocational because what I see when I tour the campus is that the joy in the classrooms. And I also... Um, will raise a concern that I have with him with Thrive Act, which is that of all, uh, the, one of the proposals is a commission to present a different assessment and accountability system. And there's a representative from all different kinds of groups and not vocational education. So this will be a great opportunity to say to him, hey, that, that's a big oversight. Somebody should be on that commission. So besides that, you'll see just various meetings. Um, with that said, I'm going to turn it back to the chair. Thank you, sir. <coughs> So, Joe, we're going to do your report next, please. Yeah, our student reps couldn't make it tonight. Uh, one thing I do want to highlight, though, is that our football team will be playing in the semifinals of the Vogue State Tournament this Friday. Where's here the game, on Joe? campus. Here. Here. Yep. There will be a home game against Blue Hills Region. Time? I believe it's 6 o'clock. Thank you. You're welcome. Very exciting. Yeah, it is. First time wow. ever First that I know of. Uh, enrollment is steady at 572, 118th from Northampton. You can see the breakdown by grades. We did have our annual open house on November 5th. Um, we had approximately 650 visitors come through on campus. That is a decline. Uh, when you look at student applications coming into the weekend, we had uh, 58. You can see the three-year um, totals there. <clears throat> student applications at open house. Uh, was 46. So you can see we're, we're pretty much in the middle of between what uh, 2021 was and, the, and a high of 2022, which was one of the highest, the highest that I have on record uh, was last year. Current total applications are 149, 28 from Northampton. You'll see that last year was 151 at this time. So it's a decline of two year over year. So even though you look at those other numbers, statistically, um, here we are 
when you look year over year timeline, we're right on pace. Uh, school council has met. Uh, we did begin to discuss the DCAP, and uh, we looking at the update the progress of our student uh, school improvement goals. We'll begin the student handbook review process in January, February timeframe. Um, Excuse me. Yes, sir. DCAP. District accommodation plan. So these are curriculum accommodation that okay. all classrooms can make. So. Um, what this means is that you know, there might be certain interventions or things that we as a school are telling all of our teachers are okay to do even if the student doesn't have an I IEP 504. These are the accepted accommodations. At the end of the day, it's good teaching, uh, but there, and so it sort of serves as a blueprint of good teaching that our teachers can review and look at, um, and the families can also access. The, one of the big things that's different here is if the student um, is potential of, uh, below a 70 failing it's mandatory that there's contact made home um, if a student gets uh, below a 70 on a test uh, they have the option to come once they seek extra help to retest uh, so that's another like those are two examples of accommodations that are mandatory here that may not exist elsewhere uh, so it's just and all those are developed through the staff input really a, a majority of them were through staff input um, and then the school council also provided input on those. Is DCAP considered a tier one intervention? It would be, yes. Um, youth advisory, so we met on October 25th. That's made up of 10 students that uh, meet with me each month. Uh, we have pizza and salad from the restaurant, uh, and we could go ahead and look over. This is our second year with that, so it's a relatively new initiative. Um, right now, we're continuing to look at the Spiffy at-risk youth survey data. We did brainstorm different ways. It was fun to hear the students' perspective on what reaches them and what doesn't. Um, you know, they didn't really think that things posted around school, they sort of are just blind to them. So posters, or hey, what this, or hey, how about that, or even in the bathroom. Some of them didn't even realize that we have, in you know, one of the initiatives from staff that was taken on was to put positive affirmations in the female bathrooms. I had students who said they weren't even aware of it. So I'm not sure, they're not even noticing those things. Um, so, you know, they did talk more about wanting to have presentations from alumni or graduates or have uh, people come back who lived through certain poor choices and experiences and share that. Um, they did like things like uh, the mock accident and other things. So they said that those were things that, that they did respond to. So um, our hope is to come up with uh, the current discussion is to look at at-risk awareness month, but come up with a better name, um, probably in the month of March, and focus on positive behaviors that our students in to combat some of the data that we see. Um, so we're going to be continue that discussion and what that could <coughs> actually look like. They had a, a great idea of uh, creating a video series of interviews around campus and things, uh, and then getting people's students' perspectives on on different uh, choices and, and what's good, what's bad, and so as a way to educate each other. Uh, we did present also to the Adams Scholarship winners. So we had 33 seniors receive the scholarships. Uh, in order to qualify, just to remind the board, uh, students must score in advance in at least one of the MCAS and proficient or higher in the other two. Um, and they have to be graduating the top 25% of their class. So there's a list of the names there uh, to be entered into the record. Health assisting instructor, we are in the interview phase for that position. So pending your questions, <coughs> my report. I have a question. Uh, we've been slowly increasing their role or <clears throat> enrollment up to 150 students per class and um, we're getting there when we reach that 600 total enrollment do we have the capacity to increase more or are we tapped out we are getting very close to being tapped out on the academic side we are running out of classroom space well we have run out of classroom space to be honest um, Many of our academic teachers are sharing spaces so they're moving around. Um, it would be difficult to get. Could we grow a little bit? Yes. Um, and I say academic side, I just want to reinforce to the board 
on the vocational side to be at capacity, typically on the average of 12 students uh, per shop, per grade, we're looking at a capacity of 720 students um, to fill all of the, the shops. There's no way at this point we can we could do that. Have academic. 720 students on campus with the academics. And back to the vision, I just want to remind the board, this is why we started the, progress, the, the process of expanding the animal science ag area. Uh, that's the easiest area where we could add new concentrations without adding a new SIP code, you know, a new Chapter 74 program, begin to you know, increase the enrollment in that particular area to the point of, um, you know, we just talked about a, a $6 million project, but the D building is the big elephant in the room. We need a new D building. Uh, if and when that day ever comes that we have a new D building, right now if you look at D building, it's like a horseshoe. That's how it's designed. Uh, if you simply took that same circumference, the same outline of D building, but made it a square and closed it, uh, you get more space, uh, more academic classrooms would be my recommendation. And then we could easily you know, begin looking at more, more students. But to get to that point, MSBA, the city, governance model, all of this on the table, but MSBA was, will say right now, you are not at capacity. So why would they fund a new building if we're not at capacity? Even, so that's been the challenge. Even though we're, we are at capacity in our academic spaces, they don't factor that in. They probably, yeah, they probably wouldn't, right? Yeah, I mean, we're close. Yeah, we're close. We yeah. All right. You know, All right, that's we would start to, to um, we'd start to degree the services that we provide students. One of the big things is our, our yeah. manageable class sizes, being able to reach all different types of learners here, uh, especially with the 90 days only of academics. Uh, but we would start to stretch the classrooms and uh, do it sometimes. Some periods there's space and other periods there's no space. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Community reports, I can just jump in quickly. Uh, Mr. Quadro, feel free. Well, I think we've covered yeah. the building yeah. committee. The property side, I, I or, um, Just, uh, like previously mentioned, we had a very lively meeting, spirited conversations, um, but we have to remember that everybody has a voice and even though we don't like to hear the voice sometimes and what they may have to say, there usually is something, some worth to what everybody has to say if you agree or disagree. Even if you disagree, there's usually something somewhere that comes out of it, some good, and it creates more dialogue. And uh, I think we have a great committee. and. Uh, Look forward to moving forward. Thank you. Jimmy? Yeah. So just a couple of quick updates. Uh, the electrical and plumbing shop is still uh, working on roughing in the companion animal building. Um, we're waiting for windows, doors, HVAC system, uh, some of the bigger electrical components to come in, um, and the new sanitary lines to get put in. And hopefully tomorrow we'll start wrapping the apple storage building in metal inside. Since our last meeting, I had the chance to tour the campus that built the companion animal building. It's beautiful. It is just gorgeous inside. A long way to go. Thank you for all of the work you've done to create that space for our students. It's really impressive. Thank you for bringing that up. I agree. And uh, there's a finance report in uh, Crystal uh, with the way of Andy said at a family emergency, <coughs> but her report is in yes. your report. So I'd like to go into new business. Yes. We have a motion a second to approve an out-of-state field trip for pre-engineering senior students to attend the New England Air Museum April 25th of 24. So moved. So moved. Second. Any additional discussion? All in favor? Aye. Thank you. We have a motion second to approve an out-of-state field trip to New York for criminal justice senior students at date of April 2024 to be determined. Motion to approve. Second. And yeah, we have potential discussion we have in the audience. Ah. It's very patient. Yeah. Yeah, very patient. We'll learn more about the tools than yeah. I ever thought. That we would. Huh? 
I'm John Farm, a senior in criminal justice. I'm Harrison, I'm also a senior. Because I'm actually sitting in criminal justice. Don't worry, we're not here to ask for money. Um so for our senior field trip, we want to go to New York. Um, we plan on going to the New York Fire Museum and Battleship Row and also the 9-11 Memorial War while we're there. Fantastic. Have Did you do that all in one day? I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. One day. Yeah. We plan to get to school around five o'clock, leave here to for um Windsor Locks, the station, the train station down there, take the train to New York. Um, get there, I believe it's around 8 o'clock. Um, hop back on the train around 7 and then be back here at 4 11. So the train from Northampton? No, from Windsor Locks. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So you're looking at New Haven. New Haven. Also, New Haven Locks. So it's, really, it's right now the fares are super inexpensive, so it would be less than $60 per student. So. Mm. Have you been to New York? Have you been to any of these places in New York before? My brother went to a couple and I, he showed me pictures. The stuff that they have there is incredible from all sorts of historic events, which I would yeah. love to see. Have you been? Yeah, I've been. Um, I haven't seen any of the things we're going to see, though. It'll be pretty impactful. The real adventure will be a train. <laughs> no subway, just the train. <laughs> okay. We're very careful for covering the forest tonight yeah. and being yeah. very patient. Yeah. Yes. And we're so appreciative of your instructors for taking this on. It's just of such value to you. It will change your lives for sure. Something you'll never forget. Um, it, in, in your shop area, but also the connections that you'll make on the trip. And it's a, a lot of work on the part of the adults. I'm really appreciating that. Thank you. Thank you. So back to it. We have a motion and a second to approve the amount of the state. So I got from. Yep. Okay, Thank all in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May have a motion and a second to approve payment of an FY23 invoice from June 15th, 23 for stadium systems for $3,750 from Athletics Revolving Account. What's this for, Mr. Palin? So moved. Second. Uh, Wait, he's got a question. Further discussion. What is it? What is it? Systems, bleachers. What's being bought for four thousand dollars? Let's go over deal to Crystal. To it's out for the United States. Definitely not for the United It was last sound? year, um, late June. Audio system, sound, speakers, mics. The stadium, it repairs on the. It could be the helmets. Uh, I'd have to check. It could be the helmets, or it could be All right. the. Well, we're going to take there. your word for it. It's worthwhile. <laughs> all in favor? Is there any additional discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. May I have a motion a second to approve payment FY23 invoice November 17, 2022 for Valley Machine Night for a whole $61.80 to be paid from the Graphic Communication Revolving Account. So moved. Second. Any additional discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to approve for discussion slash possible action vote on a horticulture building budget and timeline. Second. second. Additional discussion? Oh, yeah. I thought so. This is a big one, right? This is the big one. So, our, my understanding from all of that super helpful information you provided all of the answers to the questions um i want uh i want to make sure i'm clear on what your preference is um and your recommendation is that we approve the schematic design process so we're saying we're going to be on the hook for 5.9 million dollars or 6.8 million dollars potentially at this point those are what the estimates are right that's sort of the window uh, we're agreeing to be on the hook for that uh, going forward into this next phase we've gotten those numbers as low as we can 
we think we might be able to do within budget. There's other decisions to be made. We'll know more in yeah, January right. when we get the to be design documents. Perfectly clear. Yeah. I would say as a board, you're not if you vote to allow SMA to move to DD. So yeah. basically as a board, you're voting to approve SD. That you are not on the hook for a dollar. Right. right. There's no right. guarantee. Good point. Uh, all you're doing is going SD to is a ballpark idea, but there's no obligation that we as a board, you're not agreeing that, oh I agree to five point nine, you're not agreeing. We're, we're taking more steps down that road. Allowing us to have a clear picture. Six six point point seven. Seven. I and feel that like process takes about a month. They have a month to do their work and in January to share our report, have our feedback. The hope is that as a board you vote by the end of January that yes, the design is appropriate. Now that's the money piece we have to also agree to and then they can move on to uh, creating the bid package to, to get out. Uh, so my recommendation from when we met, met the agenda to tonight, I will be honest, sort of I've shifted a little bit uh, because I, at a, we're at a point where we can't spin our wheels. Uh, and we've been in this SD phase now for a very long time. Um, I feel comfortable that we're within that Little League ballpark. You know, we're, we're, we're close. I think we're worth it. Now it's worthwhile to move to the DD and let's get a firm design and then we can hopefully firm our numbers. Um, but at, during that phase, you as a board would say you have the ultimate authority of what you want to spend. Um, so we retain that through January? All the way through, technically, yeah. but. Um, Dr. Bonner, it, no disrespect to Dr. Lincoln Hooker whatsoever, but I'm thinking that you've had experience in different districts, in different public school districts, and potentially involved in different building projects. Um, and I'm wondering what your, so from that perspective, what's your comfort level with this? So, um, so to superintendent, I just, uh, normally in districts that I've served in, we go through Mass Building Association. So we, we jump the hoops mm -hmm. um, and to abide by whatever their requirements and constraints are for the funding and so on. So, so this, is, this is a little bit of dynamic, yeah, it's a very different, different dynamic gotcha. yeah. to, to trust your building project with an unknown of fundraising, that's, that would scare me. You know, there, all things could happen. Um, but somehow you need to shore up to make sure that you have these contingency funds. I wouldn't just say that, you know, you can keep it fixed at six million. You don't know what could happen between now and um, come the time that you even break ground. And even in the, in the midst of building, the things that could happen. Um, the supply chain has been tricky, the, the inflation has been off the charts, and um, the quality of materials has also been challenging. So, so there's, there are things to, to consider. So that's just my input there. Thank you. Unknowns. There's a lot of unknowns. Kind of different animal. Okay. This, is a, this is one of many city projects. Yes. Um, and, you know, I, I think it would be good to move to this next phase and get more information and then make more informed decisions about how, you know, whether we need to consider a gap um, and how to, how to, how to close that. But I, I think it's critical. I mean, we, we've talked about the timeline and, and the deadlines we have to meet. Otherwise, we risk losing a significant portion. So um, I think we have to move forward. Great. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Well, I think I'm moving it forward. I just, I, I think we have to clarify the, the key motion. motion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So do we I think the motion as written has to be, somebody probably should put a new motion out to approve the, the DG. Approve the SD and move to uh, DG. I, I move that we uh, approve the uh, and entering into the schematic design no, process. No, no, we approve the schematic design. design. We approve the schematic design. design process into the design, design, design development, development process. Got it. Second. Everybody clear? Yes. Okay. 
we got a, a big, and we need a vote again. Yep. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. So, uh, here we go again. We have a motion to second to approve for discussion, possible action vote. To send a support letter for HB 2337, an act relative to the use of hoisting equipment in Chapter 74 Vocational Technical Education, filed by Representative Patricia Haddad. Haddad. So moved. Thank you. Second. Any additional discussion? Dr. Lichtenhofer, do you want to just elaborate a little on that? Sure. So this is in reference to the hoisting equipment, obviously. Uh, so MAVA, we've had a lot of discussions over the last year and a half, two years. Uh, Anthony Adelahad and Venture Associates uh, has done a lot of lobbying at the State House with this. I think we're actually making some good progress. Um, but the recommendation, as Dr. Spencer Robinson mentioned, uh, through Senator Comerford's office, is that perhaps as a board, uh, you may want to share a letter uh, to both the Senate President and the Speaker of the House. So Anthony and his office had already created a form letter uh, and shared it with all the MAVA superintendents, uh, advising that if we wanted to use that as a template and share it with, with our, our local delegates. So I took that initial letter. Obviously, I didn't really add a whole lot of new content. I thought the letter was great to begin with, but it just kind of made it more personal to Smith Vocational. Um, so the letter that is, has been drafted is that, that letter. I can't take credit for it, really. Um, but if you vote for it, uh, I'd recommend that all five of you resign uh, as sort of a solidarity, and then you know, we can give it off to, to both individuals. So that's the background. Great. <clears throat> all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. We have a motion, a second to approve for discussion and possible action vote on the Board of Trustees term link. So moved. Mr. Quadro, do you want to bring, bring, bring that? Um, sure. Um, I'll second it. All right, no further discussion yeah. now, right? You got it. Okay. Um, go ahead for discussion. I just think two years is not long enough. I came into this position somewhat um, already familiar with the school and a lot of the processes because I've been involved with the carpentry shop. I'm not just doing this for myself, um, thinking of any future. Board of Trustee members, um, the learning curve, unless they had an experience like I did. Um, I think, you know, first year is just getting to learn the ropes type of thing and, and do you really get anything done? Um, that's just my opinion. And through this uh, conference at, at Cape Cod, talking to people about this, um, when I brought it, somehow it would come up and they'd say, well, how long is your term? And I'd go, two years. And I'd go, they'd go, two years? And they're, well, what's yours? And they go, most people said three, which was interesting. Um, and I don't know the reason behind that. And even, it was probably split 50-50 if they were elected like we are, as, as a citywide vote, or appointed. And I was surprised to hear the number of them were appointed as opposed to an election like we are. Um, I'm not looking to change that. <laughs> I mean, I can't, can't, can't reinvent the wheel, but I would suggest um, increasing the term to at least three years and potentially even four years. There's a possibility to do that. I have no idea how it needs to be done. Uh, you have to go back to the contents of the will, city charter, I, I have no idea. I'm just putting it out on the table for discussion. So it's it's in the city charter. I actually don't know if it's in the will. It's in the city charter and, you know, the charter was redrafted now, it's a, maybe 14 years ago, or a little bit less, 12 years ago. Um, and that that charter, that new charter went before the entire city for a vote. Um, I know that this was discussed um, like all terms were discussed during that charter, uh, that charter redrafting. The charter also goes through a review process every, I want to say every 10 years that end with a nine. So the charter review will happen in 2029. Um, but it, it would need a change to the charter. Um, and, and also, so the school committee's two terms, everyone actually is two, I think everyone's two terms. 
Um, CPA you say maintenance. terms, years? I'm oh, sorry, two year terms. Yeah, okay. two year terms. Okay. Um, it's only the mayor that was then that was changed during that charter yeah, that made total change. Um, that and that was like a many months process with a committee um, work, working with the Collins Center. So it, it's a big process. But I actually I meant to look at the will to see if it, if it was in the will at all. I don't have anyone. I don't know. think so. If the will speaks to term length. Who's Carmen? Um, her will is. I can look it up. Our historian also. It's so it's also a process process I'll note that, you know, so to to then have a charter change you have to you'd have to go through let's say it's a home rule process to change it. It would have to go through the city council. So you would have to go before a body that has two year terms and um, argue that your term should be longer than yours. <laughs> All right. Well I, I, I have a different experience. I like the two years. It's a chance to reassess, reevaluate, sort of see also get out and make my case to voters in the mm -hmm. ways that I do. Um, and not, not become complacent. Exactly. No, good point. Exactly. Okay, I just... Uh, I understand where you, this came from in your mind. I understand that totally. Yeah, no, I, I just want to get it out on the table uh, for discussion. Um, well, slash we'll possible we'll action. Some minutes, Mr. Quadro. Yeah, and so then. let's continue this discussion. Um, the reality is nothing could really even be done till 2029, potentially. Yeah, I mean, you could petition the council to try and do a home roll, but the there is a regular review that's built into the charter of yeah okay okay so i don't know if you'll still be mayor uh, when that charter commission comes around again but if, if you are <laughs> yeah. um, if you, i don't know if i'll be here either <laughs> if you are you could keep mr Quadro in mind as serving on that commission or or being being a part of that process somehow since he has the interest in it's a long ways away. That, yeah, I'm actually not sure you would want someone who hasn't been doing this long. That's a fair point. It. <coughs> it, and I have to look at what the rules are as to who served on it. Fair point. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me amend that to say uh, make sure it's on our radio when that comes around mm -hmm. so we can say, hey, is this still an issue? Or you like the two year terms? Or have any of us changed our minds? Mm -hmm. or, and also, how does the Northampton uh, School Code feel? Is and a question. I imagine to, that committee would would reach out, you know, during that process <laughs> would yeah. reach out, out to, to all the, the public elected bodies. For bodies and I know they did in 2019. Yeah. Okay. Well, I got it out on the table. Very good. Thank so you. Deb, you got it in the record, does, right? Yeah. The Kentucky and the excerpts that you read every year doesn't say anything about a term. About terms. It's just that they are um, ballot, chosen by ballot. Annually. What's that? Annually. Oh, there it is. It, annually. That's, oh, that's from um. Smith. Oh, it says annually. So then that was a change in the. Do you like to go back to every year? Yeah. <laughs> According to the will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very no, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Lee. Please find another meeting that yeah. I have to go to. Motion to adjourn. Oh, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn.